Okay. Uh, just before we formally recommence, uh, when in my introduction uh, this morning I, I'm talking about the, our colleagues from uh, uh, WEPA who are here, I mentioned that a number of the countries were preparing constitutions. As it, I was aware, in fact, that uh, Tunisia has already finalized and produced its constitution, and I'm very delighted to have received a signed copy of it uh, a moment ago, the new constitution of the Republic of Tunisia. So we'll read this with great interest and look forward to hearing. <laughs> and now, having uh, no doubt understood all the matters about how our Irish parliamentary system works after the first uh, two sessions, uh, two presentations. We're now going to have an interesting uh, session which is going to bring in a comparative perspective. Uh, firstly, to deal with reform in the House of Commons, and then secondly, in comparison with some other countries. And to make the presentation on the reform of the House of Commons, Dr. Meg Russell from the University College of London, a very much acknowledged expert in this field internationally, and we're very actually fortunate to have her here. Meg. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as Tom has said, I'm an academic at University College London, and my main research interest is parliaments, parliament in Britain and parliaments more broadly. Um, I've also worked as an advisor in the British system for our leader of the House of Commons, and I've worked most recently as an advisor to a reform committee in the House of Commons, which made some important achievements. A lot of my research has actually looked overseas to see what we can learn from other countries for reforming the British system. So one thing to say is we in Britain certainly don't think our system is perfect by any means. Uh, but also I've got a bit of a wider perspective beside just Britain. I know a bit about other countries as well. Coming in as an outsider, it's very difficult to advise. I certainly don't want to tell you what you should be doing with your system, which you know much more about than me, but I hope that I can give you some ideas from other places as to the way that things can work um, and talk not just about British experience, but a bit more generally about the dynamics of parliaments and of how parliamentary reform works. You've had my paper. I, not, I don't want to talk through the paper, but I want to talk sort of round the paper. Uh, and raise some of the same issues. Um, one thing I would say, a, a, a final preliminary thing, is that um, although the British House of Commons is an obvious place to look because you see yourselves as a Westminster system, you've obviously inherited some of the same traditions, it is also a very, very different place uh, to the Doyle, not least because it's got 650 members, and the dynamics in a big chamber like that are very different to the dynamics uh, in a small uh, parliament like yours. Um, and I might say a bit more about that. Um, the paper goes through some of the key changes that we've seen at Westminster, and I'll just mention some of those very quickly. I'm happy to come back to them in questions or in discussion later on. Um, over the last 30 years, we've seen uh, the growth of our committee system in the House of Commons, specialist committee shadowing departments, which have become more powerful, more high profile, and better respected over time. We've seen the development of some very interesting committees in our House of Lords as well, particularly with a sort of quasi-legal perspective, looking at constitutionality and human rights, that kind of thing. And those committees, I think, are very interesting and have had quite an important impact on the quality of legislation. Um, we have seen the move to um, election by secret ballot of our presiding officer, who we call the Speaker of the House of Commons, the equivalent of yours, I hesitate with the pronunciation, Can Corda. Uh, um, so you might want to talk about that. Um, we've also seen most recently, as a result of the uh, reform committee that I worked with, also a move to um, election by secret ballot of committee chairs, which is a really important development, I think, uh, and might be worth talking more about as an option here. Um, and at the same time, alongside that reform, um, uh, there was a change to the way that the agenda of Parliament is put together. Um, so we've now got time carved out for backbenchers, so not run by the government or the opposition, but run by backbenchers in, in parties, to put things on the agenda on a cross-party basis. 
And what gets onto the agenda is actually controlled by a committee, a cross-party committee of backbenchers, and that's been a very important reform as well. But there are things, I think, in Britain that might be of interest to you which are not the result of reform, but long-standing um, things that we have. Um, so our committee chairs are shared out proportionately between the parties. Um, we have committee chairs from the government side and from the opposition side um, and the third party as well. And committee chairs are quite outspoken. There's no real obvious difference between committee chairs from the government and the opposition. Both are prepared to uh, be outspoken on behalf of parliament and criticize government sometimes. We also have this thing which we call the liaison committee which is a committee made up of the chairs of all of the specialist committees. This has become an increasingly important voice for Parliament um, in defending Parliament, defending the interests of committees, getting them more resources, but also for the last 10 or so years, questioning the Prime Minister several times a year on a sort of cross-party, cross-committee basis, and that's been a very interesting reform. Um, Again, in terms of traditions, uh, but a tradition which has strengthened in Britain, one of the things you might find interesting is that we have a lot of cross-voting in the House of Commons. It's not unusual at all for members to vote against their whip. Parties in the House of Commons are definitely seen as strong, um, if not dominant, but partly because we have such a large chamber. Tony Blair, when he, when he became Prime Minister in 1997, had a parliamentary party group with more than 400 members in it. You cannot control 400 members all of the time. And it was at that time when he had that overwhelming majority that backbenchers became more and more outspoken. And it's now pretty routine for there to be votes against the party on the government side and sometimes on the opposition side as well. So that, I think, might be interesting to you. It's, it's really become pretty uncontroversial that that happens. It seems to me that there have been some good changes here. So on some things, you're ahead of us. So you've obviously strengthened your committee system. And I think it's really interesting, this reform, to look at what you're calling the heads of bills, what we call draft bills. Having uh, witnesses in uh, into committees to talk about the principles of bills before they get formalized is a really good reform, I think. We've been trying to get there for years. We do a bit of it but you've put it in your standing orders, and that is great. You're ahead of us on that. In, in the paper, I focus quite a lot on mechanisms for reform and on sort of cultural aspects and the challenges of reform. I think one thing you might want to think about is you've got such a short time here to consider all of this big complex area. Is there a mechanism that you would like to recommend to look at Doyle reform uh, more closely over a longer period. You've clearly got this um, parliamentary subcommittee on Doyle reform. I don't know how effective it is, but one thing that you could do is give it some instructions or some suggestions or even set up a new committee of the kind that we had uh, in the House of Commons a, a few years ago with a very clear kind of set of criteria on which you want it to report, on which you want it to bring forward detailed proposals, because detailed proposals take time to work up. One key thing that I say in the paper, um, and that I've learned from the UK and also looking at other places, is that it's very hard to, it's really not sensible to even try to impose reform from outside. In the end, reform needs to come from inside Parliament itself. At the very least, a majority of parliamentarians have to be behind the reform. Otherwise, it just won't work. It will be ignored. It will be undermined. So parliamentarians need to have an enthusiasm for the changes. They need to have some ownership of the changes. Um, and here, I think it's worth reflecting on um, the, the complexity of parliaments, these interesting bodies that we have, and the complexity of the way that they influence um, the policy process. A lot of what goes on in parliaments is actually about relationships between people. A lot of the change that you want is probably cultural and behavioral rather than in terms of rules. Now, you can use rules to get people to change their behavior, but you can't force them to change their behavior if they don't want to. Uh, and a big part of that is about parties and people's loyalty to parties. I've seen in some of, the paper, some of the other papers, and it's been mentioned this morning, about the extent to which government controls parliament. 
But as I say at the end of my paper, it's very hard to say, actually, whether government controls parliament or the other way around. Uh, in the Constitution, parliament controls government. People tend to say in popular parlance that it's the other way around, but you can't really separate the two. Um, Murish's presentation uh, emphasized that the Doyle both creates the government and scrutinizes the government. So certainly by creating the government, it is controlling the government. The fact that the government has to have a majority in the Doyle means that the Doyle is, in a sense, in charge. And if members of the parties which are in government um, don't complain about what the government is doing, it might be because the government is doing what they want rather than because they don't have the nerve to speak out against the government. You have to always bear that in mind. Um, the way that parliaments exercise power can be very subtle. So our select committees in the House of Commons, which are seen as powerful, actually have relatively little formal power to force policy, virtually no formal power to force policy change. They don't look at legislation. They can't make government do anything. But they are seen as very powerful. Um, I've done a big research project on the select committees. We went around and interviewed a lot of people um, about their work. And my experience in Britain is that if you want to know how, po how powerful parliament is, sometimes you need to ask people in government rather than people in, in parliament. Now, I interviewed somebody who'd been a very senior cabinet minister in Britain. He'd held several senior posts, and I asked him about his relationship with the select committees. Um, and he said, in my ministry, we were constantly having discussions about how would this policy look if there was an inquiry into it by a committee? Could we defend this if it came out publicly? So the way that the committees are working is through getting, getting ministers to think in advance about what they're doing, to make sure that it is defensible, to make sure that they could uh, legitimately account for what they've been doing. You don't see that kind of influence. Um, it's the, the power of anticipated reactions, what we call generating fear. Um, thinking about what Parliament would say if we did something is Parliament's biggest power, arguably. Um, we also talked in that report about the power of exposure. Parliament is a very public setting where people are asked to account for their actions. This applies not just to ministers, but also, um, as you will have soon on your banking inquiry, people from the private sector. This is a very important power of parliament. If parliament wasn't there, if that public forum didn't exist, those private sector individuals would never have to account publicly. They would never have to answer questions in front of the cameras. So that is a very big power of parliament. Hence, you can't necessarily measure Parliament's power in terms of conflict. It has other very important powers as well. Um, one reason that um, people say that maybe Parliament is controlled by government rather than the other way around is because of the power of parties, and this has been mentioned in several of the papers. But you're not going to get rid of parties. You can't smash and destroy parties. If you think about, if you had a party of 166, independent members with no parties at all, one of the first things they would do would be to start to form little groupings of like-minded people to work together more efficiently. Parties would form. That is how they formed in the British Parliament. Um, they are a natural thing to exist in a parliament, and they also offer accountability to the electorate. Um, so parties are there to stay. They make sense. Um, you can't destroy the whip. But maybe what you can do is start to loosen its ties a little bit to discourage absolutely blind loyalty to parties. Things like committees, which take evidence from outsiders, which get people together across party lines, encourage a kind of loosening of those party ties and evidence-based policy making, rational decision making. And we've done quite a lot of that in the British Parliament. Um, so we've, done, we've, we've also introduced a lot of changes which require people to work across party lines, not just in committees, but in things like for nominating uh, the presiding officer, uh, our speaker. We've not just got secret ballots, but we require nomination on a cross-party basis. So you can't just have nominees, uh, you can't just be nominated by people from your own party. Likewise, committee chairs, 
If you're going to elect committee chairs, not just the election, but requiring that they have the support of people from more than one party. As we have done, maybe providing agenda time for backbenchers, but requiring that there are people from more than one party who are trying to get that onto the agenda. Um, one of the things that we have discussed in the UK and not done, but which is interesting, um, is giving more control of the rest of the agenda um, to Parliament. And one place I looked was Scotland, um, where they, um, they actually put their agenda. Not only is, is the agenda agreed by a cross-party group uh, of parliamentarians, it's actually put to the vote in the chamber. Um, so parliamentarians are asked whether they want to accept the agenda that is proposed. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be defeated because the anticipated reactions element comes in here, the accountability element. If you know that it could be subject to a vote, then you're less likely to put an agenda which isn't going to be accept acceptable across party lines. Um, so there are lots of things that you can do, and the liaison com committee is another one, uh, our committee made up of committee chairs to encourage people to understand each other across party lines, work across party lines, start thinking about rational, uh, evidence-based decision-making rather than purely being driven by the whip, rather than going for the whip itself. And I'd better stop there. Thanks very much. <laughs>